Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Nuclear Criticality Safety Lecture Series. So far in this course, we've discussed several historical criticality accidents, and our goal in reviewing these accidents is to learn about the circumstances and the mistakes that led to these accidents so that we might prevent future accidents. If we look at all 22 historical process nuclear criticality accidents, we notice that in a large majority of these accidents, 16 out of 22, that poor conduct by operations staff was a factor in causing these accidents. This poor conduct includes poorly trained operators and supervisors, a poor understanding of or a poor implementation of these site's nuclear criticality safety program, production pressures leading to dangerous shortcuts by operations and management, and a lack of appreciation for the meaning of safe limits. In fact, seven out of these 22 criticality accidents were either partially or completely caused by poorly designed criticality safety limits. We'll discuss limits and controls in much more detail in the following lecture. If we look at a historical timeline of criticality accidents, we notice several things. First, that criticality accidents are actually pretty rare. On average, between 1945 and 2014, a criticality accident occurred once every 3.1 years. However, we also notice that this already low accident rate was made even lower after 1964, dropping to an average of one accident every approximately 10 years. So what happened in 1964? What happened was that the United States of America Standard Institute released the first set of consensus-based nuclear criticality safety standards. Today we're going to discuss these safety standards, which are commonly used to license and structure criticality safety programs across the country. We'll discuss what these standards are, their content, and how they are used by criticality safety programs at different sites. One of the main goals of nuclear criticality safety is to mitigate the consequences of, and to ideally prevent, any criticality accidents. As we discussed in the previous lecture, there are many, many ways to perturb the Boltzmann transport equation and to introduce a potentially dangerous amount of reactivity. Because of this, criticality safety involves a great deal of technical expertise and engineering intuition. However, at its heart, criticality safety is an industrial safety field that aims to protect its workers and the members of the public. Like in other safety fields, it makes sense to develop a set of consensus-based standards and best practices to use as a guide for developing, maintaining, and regulating criticality safety programs. Developing one single recipe for a criticality safety program can be difficult because of the potentially huge variance in how a site operates. We've already discussed how different moderation effects can be in over-moderated versus under-moderated systems, and this difference is pretty huge, but the criticality safety plan for a site can also depend on the goals and the characteristics of the facility, the scale and frequency of fissile material operations, the potential consequence of criticality accidents, and the site's ability to respond to accidents, any special requirements from the site's regulators, and about half a hundred other factors. Some sites, such as Sandia National Laboratories, might maintain a relatively small amount of fissile material that's used in a limited set of criticality experiments, while other sites, such as Los Alamos National Laboratory or Y12, might routinely convert large volumes of fissile solution into fissile metal parts and then machine that metal into a variety of shapes. There's quite a breadth in how different sites use fissile material. The ANSI ANS Nuclear Criticality Safety Standards provide a guide for building and maintaining a criticality safety program. These standards are developed by the American Nuclear Society, but they use the ANSI framework for standards, which is why they're called the ANSI slash ANS standards. Within the American Nuclear Society, these standards are developed by consensus committees of nuclear criticality safety experts from all across the world. These committees usually meet once or twice each year, usually at ANS conferences, and they discuss, debate, and gradually arrive at a consensus for the content of each standard. These standards are not just written once, but they're actually living documents that are reviewed and revised regularly by the different ANS standards committees. Service on these standard committees is voluntary, but it's usually a very valuable use of time. 
Not only do these standards committees provide a valuable networking opportunity and produce a very valuable product, but these committees allow different sites to communicate and to share their points of view, their lessons learned, and their concerns for practices that could lead to a criticality accident. So what's exactly in these standards? Well, these standards can't be too specific because they apply to various sites with unique characteristics, unique considerations, and unique challenges. So instead, the standards tell sites what they need to do, but not how to do it. In general, each ANSI ANS standard must describe the scope of that standard, it must define all necessary terms or concepts in the standard, and it must describe the requirements to comply with the standard. Generally, these standards are either administrative, such as ANSI ANS 8.1, the mother of all criticality safety standards, which outlines how to perform operations with fissile material outside of a reactor. Standards can also outline the safe application of some specific control or safety mechanism, such as ANSI ANS 8.14, which describes the use of soluble neutron absorbers. Lastly, standards could also describe the structure or protocols for an emergency response program, such as ANSI ANS 8.13, which describes criticality accident alarm systems. These slides, which are taken from material presented by Doug Croucher at the University of New Mexico's Criticality Safety Short Course, show a sample list of administrative standards, application standards, and emergency response standards. These standards use very specific verbiage to differentiate between which recommendations are optional and which recommendations are mandatory, and by mandatory I mean carved into stone and left atop Mount Sinai mandatory. In these standards, a statement that uses the verb shall denotes a requirement that must be met. For example, in the ANSI ANS 819 standard, which describes forming nuclear criticality safety training programs, Article 7.3 states that the nuclear criticality safety evaluation shall be documented with sufficient detail, clarity, and lack of ambiguity to allow independent judgment of results by personnel familiar with the physics of nuclear criticality, the facility operations, and the associated nuclear criticality safety practices. It makes sense for this to be a concrete requirement. If a criticality safety evaluation documenting fissile material operations lacks sufficient clarity, then it just leaves too much up to interpretation by operators, managers, and regulators. We don't want to make operations staff or our criticality safety evaluation reviewers have to guess at what our evaluation requires. Thus, this statement uses the shall verb, which means that it is absolutely mandatory. The verb should denotes a strong recommendation that is not a firm requirement. Generally, licensees must either comply with should statements, or they must justify why they do not. In ANSI ANS 819, Article 5.2 states that nuclear criticality safety training should be obtained from the nuclear criticality safety staff. It makes sense for this to be a should statement. Obviously, nuclear criticality safety staff will usually be the best people to conduct criticality safety training, but there are circumstances when this might not be true. For example, if this was a shall statement, then a criticality safety veteran who got promoted to management would be ineligible to help with their site's training program. Likewise, a shall here would make external consultants ineligible to conduct criticality safety trainings, and it would make it impossible for a small facility that just hired an entirely new set of criticality safety staff to receive any training whatsoever. Lastly, the verb may denotes permission for some action. May statements are neither requirements nor recommendations. They are completely optional. Licensees have the freedom to choose to follow or choose to ignore May statements. In ANSI ANS 819, Article 5.3.3 states that general guidance for a nuclear criticality safety training program may be obtained from ANSI ANS 8.20. The 819 standard describes administrative practices for nuclear criticality safety, and the 8.20 standard describes nuclear criticality safety training. So by using a may statement here, 819 suggests using 820 as a guide for developing a criticality safety program, but it does not mandate it. 
mandating the use of 8.20 would tie 8.19 and 8.20 together, when in reality, the licensee should work with their regulator for developing a criticality safety training program. Again, the standards tell you what you need to do, but they don't tell you how to do it. So how do sites work with and adopt these standards in practice? Adopting ANSI ANS standards is actually voluntary. Sites can choose to comply with these standards, which generally makes licensing their facility more straightforward, but they can also choose not to comply with the standards if their site has unique needs or if the standard does not apply to their site. For example, ANSI ANS 8.5 describes the use of borosilicate glass rashig rings, which are essentially glass tubes, as a neutron absorber. But a site would have no need to comply with 8.5 if they didn't use rashig rings. So, compliance with ANSI-ANS standards is completely voluntary, except when it isn't. For example, DOE-owned facilities, which are operated by contractors, state in their operations contract that the contractors must comply with ANSI-ANS criticality safety standards. Likewise, with some exceptions, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission also requires that their licensees comply with nuclear criticality safety standards. This lecture has described the purpose, structure, and use of ANSI-ANS standards in nuclear criticality safety. We'll review some of these standards and some of their content in future homework assignments, and you'll also see various standards referenced throughout the course. So the goal of this lecture was for you to understand what these standards come from and how they are used. In the following lecture, we'll begin discussing how limits and controls can be employed to ensure that fissile material operations remain safely subcritical.